So the next session is cyber hygiene for OT, acknowledging the differences. OT security has become an area of interest for the cluster. Last year, we ran a webinar on the topic, which gained a lot of interest and explored the development of an OT security special interest group as well, which I think if we get the interest in the topic today, we'd like to officially kick off um, from this conference. So we're also starting a collaborative project in November funded by Intertrade Ireland, looking at the Northern Irish and Irish um, advanced manufacturing sectors to better understand their cybersecurity maturity, their training needs, uh, and also the required cybersecurity solutions that those companies have, and to facilitate introductions between Irish and Northern Irish companies with the advanced manufacturing sector in Ireland. So back to this session, uh, we have Darren Russell, CISO of ESB, who's going to chair the session and will discuss how the approach to secure OT environments has evolved from an isolation approach to connectivity-based one, and how has this relationship between IT and OT teams evolved in recent times, and what impact the new cybersecurity re regulations are going to have. So, Darren. Hi everyone. Uh, as Owen said, I'm the CISO at the ESV. My name is Darren Russell, and uh, I'd just like to thank Cyber Ireland for the opportunity to present here today and discuss a topic close to my heart. So we have a good panel. We have Brian, Willie, and Ronald. Ronald from the NCSE, Willie from ISA, and uh, Brian, Brian, and Brian from McKesson. So uh, I might just take a seat and I'll be lazy, and we'll do all the questions from sitting down. All right. Uh, okay. So. So we'll just jump straight into it, and I suppose the, the first question I might uh, target at you, Willie, is just how do you define operational technology, and what is it, and what isn't it? Okay, um, excellent question. Um, IoT, um, I like the definition I got from um, one of my customers on my workshop, and they were going like, if it has a CPU in it, and it's not IT, it must be OT which was their way of saying, if we don't like the toy, let somebody else take care of it. Um, that was one of their parts. I'm not sure if that's the official definition of it. Um, operational technology, which means that everything that is moving stuff, doing that kind of stuff, is, is called OT. Um, there is a standard called ISA 95 that tells you that if a function, and we're not talking about the system, but we're talking about the function, is critical for your production environment in any way or shape, being it for the quality, the efficiency, safety, maintaining the regulatory compliance, that function actually is an operational function. So even a system like a SQL Server, if you really need it to produce or to maintain your regulatory compliance, that system actually is like an OT system, not an IT system anymore. It's the functionality based. Um, we are, if you look at the current systems, we are using loads of technologies that are pretty similar to what you would expect on the IT environment. We're using more and more commercially off the shelf available products, system on chips, real time operating systems, to get all the integration, to get all those features integrated into one, which means that we are OT, we are using it for operational technology, but we share the same technology as the IT people, which means we're also sharing the same vulnerability as the IT people. Um, in the old days, people would go like, yeah, but what we're doing is so strange, nobody knows about it. And that's not the case anymore. We're using normal TCP products, normal TCP stacks, all that stuff is the same as what IT is doing. The other part that is that the way we use it is completely different we are the ones who are using it 24-7. When we're running 24-7, 50 weeks a year, we have no downtime or very few little downtime, so doing weekly patches is out of the question. I mean, there is no patch Tuesday on OT. On OT, we kind of think like, patch August the 14th, we get two hours to maintain and update the systems. That's it. So those are the big differences. That's one part. The other part is that we still are running very old stuff, the legacy stuff. Stuff that was designed in the 80s, 90s of the previous century, um, which were designed not with anything which could, would you would one consider to be cybersecurity in mind. So these products are inherently insecure because they were not designed to be secure. 
And we kind of feel, or at least the asset owners kind of feel, that we cannot replace them because it's expensive, we don't have the downtime, we need to do the validations. There's all kinds of arguments that we have that we do not want to change anything to the system. But it's insecure. So those are the, the, the big differences between IT and OT. Yeah, and just, just uh, Ronald, I might just ask you, uh, in your own role in the NCC, just in general, why is the security of operational technology so important at a national level in, in the NCC? Why is there such a focus on it and, and the directives and different things that are out? Just to, exp just to expand. Okay. Yeah, um, just to expand on Willie's um, explanation there, um, OT, generally speaking, um, delivers a physical function, be that a service or uh, something that impacts the world. Um, in different scenarios, different companies, different vendors, that service can become critical to society, to the economy, to the protection of life. So um, if you think of uh, various operators of essential services, is how we class them in the, in the NCSE, if you think of various operators of essential services that are delivering particular services that are of critical importance to the state, to society, and for the protection of life. Um, if something happens to the OT network, that is delivering that service, um, be it malicious or accidental, um, it can have a serious societal impact, economic impact, um, or indeed have a serious threat to life. And that's why it's very, very important. Yeah, thank you. Thanks. And I think uh, Willie touched on it a little bit just around uh, the challenge with IT, OT convergence, which is a buzzword, but maybe Brian, just a little bit from yourself, just around what you see the major challenge in securing OT systems at the moment, and. And then just, I guess, when Willie was talking, he was talking about that legacy stuff, working with IT, and in the past it was proprietary protocols and proprietary hardware, and now we've got this convergence where we're using IT protocols and IT commodity hardware and operating systems and things like that. So you might just explain a little bit what you see the big challenges there. Yeah, um, I suppose, how long do we have? Um, I think, look, there's, I suppose if I was to think about it, there's lots of different things. Willie touched on them, you just mentioned a few more. Three, three main themes, I think, for me. Like, one is about, the potential complexity of the environments. What I mean by that is, if you get down to understand what's actually in there, it may not actually be that complex, but getting to that point of understanding what you're dealing with can be quite difficult. Because some, some of these areas are kind of black boxes. Um, then it's kind of really about the talent. Trying to get talent in this area is difficult. And I don't just mean, you know, kind of the straight line person who's been in ICS security for 10 years. They don't really exist because this is something relatively new. You need kind of a mix of different types of talent to be, I suppose, credible in, on the factory floor when you're trying to have these conversations as a CISO or a head of IT or whatever. You need a mix of people who know ICS, they know automation, they know cybersecurity, they know IT, to your point about convergence. You need all those things together. And I also think, and this may be a bit controversial with a lot of vendors outside the door, but when we talk about talent, we all talk about trying to get talent, but I think you need to consider what is your talent that you have doing today and I heard someone say recently, I thought it was quite interesting, for companies that are somewhat mature in the IT and the OT space, have done something, uh, a good thing to do might be not to buy anything for a year and just go out and patch, understand your environment and fix what you have because I think we're constantly distracting our talent with let's get the next platform and the other platform and everything else. So I'll, ne I'll never be invited back to this again after saying that. But, uh, <laughs> um, and the third one then is really, I, this might sound a bit uh, kind of contradictory, it's kind of, Complacency, I might describe it. What I mean by that is a lot of companies know that this space is where they make their money, but they're not really paying a lot of attention to it. It's improved over the last five years, but there still are some companies out there who kind of know there's a problem over there, but not really compelled to deal with it yet. They're kind of whistling past the graveyard yet. So uh, I say complacency from that perspective. And also because I think even of those, those of us in this space, we find that a lot of our colleagues in other parts of the business understand how much of a problem this is, want to support it, but aren't really excited by it. It's probably not a very exciting space, but you know, fundamentally it's what makes money for a lot of companies, so it needs to be. So those would be my three. Oh, thanks, Brian. And I suppose just uh, again, just on the whole involvement and you know, Gartner talk about cyber physical systems and IIoT and IoT and 
there's, you know, they, you know, just, just in general, Willie, what do you think the kind of the future is for OT and where it's going and the direction it's going? And uh, obviously, there's there's legacy systems and there's what we have now. But where do you see mm -hmm. things going uh, in particular? In that one? Well, um, if you look at it from uh, the, the the like the IT and OT are converging, and especially when it comes to the technology that we're using. Um, I think that um, we, we as vendors and people need to realize that we have to be more um, aware of the fact that it's cybersecurity. Um, we have to step out of the, do we really want to buy a system now and leave it up and running, do not touch it for 15 years, um, and consider that, that to be a good plan, because it doesn't work with cybersecurity like that. I mean, I mean, I know it's the mantra from cybersecurity, from, from the OT environment, if it ain't broke, don't fix it and never touch a running system. Those are the mantras that we all live by. I mean, and unfortunately, we can't do that anymore. But it also means that the vendors out there need to understand, and they are working on it, because I have some inside information on that topic, but they are working on having new products out there that are addressing the specific risks that we need, or the specific functionality that we need for the, our OT environment, but are also working towards being more and more secure. But it also means that we as asset owners need to buy the stuff. So we need to get, get in the parts like, yeah, we still have an S5 PLC, and they're beautiful products. I work with them. And I had like black hair, and a little bit more hair. Um, and they're still running, yes, but we need to fix it. We need to step up. We need to start buying the new stuff. We need to get the SLAs up there with, with the people. And we need to really look into, when it comes to the digitization, is like, where do we need to get the data? And where do we really need to scatter the data around? Do we really need to focus the data? Which systems need to communicate with which other systems and why? What's the business reason behind it? And then we can start working into a much more, more integrated system. Yeah. But IT and OT will still be different. Yeah. Yeah. They, they will not be the same. And I think that's the thing is that the, what I say is the principles are the same. But the nuances and the, the business environment and the, the operational model that's in place is there's, there's nuances there and uh, there is no one size fits all, you know, it's, it's different, you know. It is, it is the real time aspects of process control, yeah. it is the safety aspects of process control. Those are all things that do not apply on normal IT. Yeah. And because they do not apply on normal IT, we need to take that, those stuff into consideration. Yeah, and I suppose just even ourselves in the ESB, like we're an operator of essentially services and we work very closely with the compliance team and it was great to see the, the slide today from, from the NCC just around the, the setup in the team and I know uh, Ronald is working on the compliance team, but I might just ask you a question around, uh, around the NIST directive and NIST directive 2 and like what are the main risks or the benefits that operate, you know, what, what, what are the main benefits there with the directive and what are the main risks you're trying to help well, for those who aren't aware, um, the NIS Directive is Network and Information Systems Directive, and it has been updated recently. The final text hasn't been agreed yet, but it should be out shortly, uh, NIS 2. Um, and basically, it's about um, defining, identifying operators of essential service critical within seven sectors in NIS 1. It's been uh, greatly expanded in NIS 2 and then to promote a culture of risk management in cybersecurity um, using industry best practices within those uh, uh, areas. So if you think of a particular um, area defined, uh, say for example, it's all public knowledge, it's all published out there that the, uh, aviation is one of the sectors, um, you can imagine the safety and risk implications of bad cyber in um, the aviation industry, especially for the big players. So the NIS directive um, set out criteria to identify the main players in each jurisdiction for um, the different sectors. They were classified then as operators of essential services and uh, each of those then engaged with the NCSC on what they should be doing for, to promote risk management of cyber within their organizations. And that's been expanded in NIS2. Yeah. And basically, NIS2 is broader, wider, deeper. Yeah. So more sectors, um, wider systems uh, being captured. It sets standards uh, deeper into the, the, the um, organization so that it's, it's requiring greater uh, compliance um, 
from the from the different organisations. Yeah, no, and again, being true with uh, the self-assessment process and the corrective action plans and agreeing them, and the whole discussion around uh, risk versus compliance. And you know the business case, and you know making the improvements or making the risk-based approaches. And uh, Brian, just in your own experience, just in dealing with uh, with different regulations and standards in your own industry, like how do you get the business case right, and how do you take that risk-based approach and balance yeah. it between compliance and? Yeah, um, I suppose some things like we, um, for those who don't know, McKesson, we're you know U.S. European company, but large uh, distributor of medical devices or medical systems, products and so on. So COVID-19 vaccines would have been a huge thing for us the last couple of years, supply chain. So we look at some things like that. So there'll be drivers such as FDA requirements or Project Warp Seed as it was in the US. The federal government is telling you, if you want this contract, you must do these things and you have to be able to prove them. So the business case for that's kind of, it's not easy to implement, but it's somewhat straightforward. Um, so going back to what I said previously, um, you know, the business case, for a lot of this is about, you know, what I described as the money making machine. So whatever your company does, where you're making the money and is OT in there. And you can very quickly, you know, at a, at a board level, break that down into, you know, an hour of loss availability, an hour of loss production equals X. But the key thing for me in terms of the business case, I found in what we've done over the last three to four years in McKesson, is not so much that. I think it's, I won't say it's easy to get buy-in at that level. You just gotta get your ducks in a row and have the right information maybe bring one of the big four in with you if you can afford them, um, and you'll be able to get the buy-in. The challenge with the business case is all the way down the, the, the org chart, if you like. So the thing we think about in this space is kind of, I call it the Whiffram principle, what's in it for me? So everybody you're talking to in that stakeholder chain will have a particular thing they're concerned about. So it's fine to say the board gave me money. If you go into a plant and say, I'm here from head office with a clipboard and the board gave me money, you'll probably get a cup of tea and be told, go again. So you have to think about the people you're dealing with and what's important for them, be able to speak their language. So you can build a business case at the top level, but to get it to be effective all the way down, you need to consider the different component parts of that so that it becomes effective because most companies, big or small, will have what I call good corporate citizens. People are not gonna say, we're not gonna do this, no way. They may eventually, if you stick around long enough, but they want to engage and be involved, but you need to be able to you know, give them something to buy into and, and show that you're going to help them, not just give them a list of things to fix. Yeah, and I think, I think that's a really important point that you're making there is that relationship between the, the automation people and the control and instrumentation people and the IT people. And, yeah. and Willie, just a question towards you. How have you seen that relationship evolve? I'd say a number of years ago there would have been a siloed, but now there's a little yeah. bit more collaboration. And what have you seen happen in that space just between IT and OT teams and what's kind of working well in that space? <sighs> If IT and OT work together as equal partners, we are in heaven. Um, but the important wording, the two important words here, as equal partners. Um, because sometimes we see that IP people, IT people think that these, uh, it's probably the impression, the idiots from OT, they don't know what they're doing. And, um, I mean, they don't know Cisco, so if you don't know the Cisco, Cisco command line, it commands, what are you doing in this environment? Uh, that's not the, 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 that doesn't work very well. I mean, OT people are different from IT people. Um, IT people can learn a lot from OT people. OT people can learn a lot from IT people. Um, but we have to see each other as equal partners. We have different skill sets. Um, the IT people are working a lot longer with cybersecurity, are doing and dealing a lot longer with the firewalls, the IDSs, all those nice shiny objects than we have been on the OT side. However, we're not complete idiots. I'm not the perfect example for that one, maybe, but um, we kind of know what we're doing. But so take us seriously, because sometimes we end up with scenarios where you warn people up front and they still do it. And I still remember one very clear out of my own personal per, uh, uh, experience where a VMware uh, supervisor was going like, I'm going to upgrade the VMware tools on your virtual machine. What can go wrong? Six hours, lo lo six hours of production loss later, he kind of goes like, ah, there was something wrong, yes. Ah, I didn't know, no, but the normally it should work. Yeah, that's the problem. It's the normally it should work in this particular scenario because we were using old legacy stuff which was not programmed correctly 20 years ago, but we still haven't found the time to upgrade and do that stuff. You messed up. Take us seriously. 
IT take OT seriously, OT take IT seriously. If we can control everything together, then we are in heaven. Yeah, and, I, and I find myself even in our areas where we have legacy systems, like getting the change in there and bringing it up to level is it's a tougher space. But, but when you do security by design and you shift left and you get involved early and work with the OT guys on new sites or new greenfield sites, it's like, you know, it work, it's, it's a little easier. I don't know, Brian, if you want to expand on that, because you'll probably have to deal with a bit of this as well. Yeah, I, look, I think you're only as good as your last success or failure. So, you know, all of these locations talk to each other. And, you know, if you're getting a bit of traction, then you have an issue. If you bring something down, then you're in trouble. Yeah. Um, and I know there's some phrase about, you know, bad news gets around the world before good news puts his pants on or something like that. But anyway, the point is you could do 100 things well, and then you've one issue and it's a problem. But, you know, touch on Willie's point. We tried a few different times to get this off the ground. We eventually did. It was that cross-functional team I talked about that were focused on it. You can't do this corner of the desk in your spare time. A lot of companies try to do it, and it just doesn't really work. You have to be serious about it. Yeah, I agree, I agree. I think uh, like that 50-50 partner model is good, but there's a journey to get there sometimes, and, yeah. uh, you know, and it's working through that. Ronald, just uh, a little bit again just around uh, the skills and talents. You know, when you're working on the, the NIST directive and the different people, and especially in the OT space, just around uh, training and guidance uh, available. Do you think there's sufficient training and guidance available in the area or? Well, yes, there is a lot out there. Um, the NCSC itself has some OT guidance on, it, on its website. There's a lot out there, but every case is different. Each business will have its own business risks. Each business will have its own set up, its own particular peculiar. Yeah, its own um, special uh, yeah, way of doing things um, uh, with, within, within the organization to suit its business model. Um, what it really boils down to is the governance, risk, and compliance. Uh, governance, risk, and compliance is um, just as important in OT as it is in IT. And as well as that, it strikes me, really, uh, it's, it's somewhat similar to years ago, the old adage that... Um, the, uh, the IT give out about the business and business give out about the IT because IT want the systems because they're geeks and business uh, want the systems because they're trying to make money or, or, or perform the function. So IT is saying the business isn't using our systems properly and um, the, the business side is saying IT isn't delivering properly. Um, without the talk, without the, the joined up thinking and the working together, as equal partners, you won't get the full value from the IT for the business, and the business won't function as efficiently as it could. It's the same between IT and OT. There has to be a joined up um, system there. You do need um, governance, risk, and compliance in OT, just like in, I in IT. You need to know the risks that you're running on the manufacturing side. You need to know the risks you're running, both physical in some instances and, and to health and safety, et cetera, uh, but also to the business operations and the business continuity um, are, are of the, the particular entity that, that's running it. And then from that, from the risks and your risk appetite within your company, you can develop um, your governance structure, what policies, procedures, standards you wish, and then you can develop a compliance framework out of that to make sure that what risks you have decided you are going to accept are actually the risks that are being taken. Um, so uh, uh, one of the, my particular pet hates is risk aggregation, where um, let's just say people in certain functions within, uh, within a business will um, aggregate the risk coming out of that function and by the time it actually reaches decision makers, senior management, they get a low risk uh, that uh, our system, system impacts is low or system unavailability is, the risk is low. But within that is hidden an OT risk that's critical or within that is an IT risk that's critical or it could be a safety risk that's critical. Yeah. Um, and unless the, the, the proper risk management and governance structure and compliance structure is in place, um, the business, senior management within business will be making decisions on incomplete information. Yeah, and I guess even from a, an enterprise risk management perspective, like, you know, cyber's the new kids to the party, privacy, you know, there's long established things. And I think that whole second line of defense and how we do uh, oversight and report risks up, like, you know, it's evolving all the time. And, and even listening to the guys earlier with the CIO reporting into the CISO, you know, there's a challenge there always uh, about reporting up from your own area and stuff like that. Uh, just, Willie, I might just ask you a question as well, just uh, around standards and 
the standards that are out there in this space, you know, there's a lot of standards, mm -hmm. there's a lot of frameworks, and we yeah. heard a lot of them here today. And what are you seeing in the market there, as, uh, especially when you consider IT and OT teams working closer together and being 50-50 partners and using common language? So you can have an IT very centric standard, you can have an OT. So what, so what are you seeing in that space? Uh, that, that, that well, could um, there are two things. We have the um, public standards, which is like the NIST Directive uh, or the NIST Directive 2 or NIST D, whichever abbreviation you prefer. Uh, we have NIST, the cybersecurity framework, NIST CSF. Um, those are public standards. There's public do documents. Everybody can download them, everybody can read them. Um, they're not full-blown standards. I mean, if you look at uh, my part of the world, the, the OT part of the world, we use the ISO, IEC, uh, ISA 62443, where the NIST directive is 30 pages, something like that. Um, we have 800 pages worth of in yeah. 14 different documents. Um, but that's licensed material. It's owned by ISA and IEC, and you need to purchase it. But it's a very broad uh, environment. Yeah. Um, the cool thing is about the standards and with the ISO as being in the committee, um, ISO actually has like a standard on writing standards, which means there can no, never be two competing standards. Um, that's in the rules of ISO, which means that Yes, we have 27,000 as being a standard, and yes, we have 62443 as being a standard, um, and they're both controlled by IEC, which means they are not competing. Um, the cool thing is, is that if you look at NIST Directive or if you look at NIST CSF, you can actually make complete mappings from the requirements as being written down in the NIST Directive, which applies to everybody here in Europe, or NIST CSF if you're a little bit more internationally oriented, um, you can actually make a mapping to all the points of NIST directive and you get some real structural guidance with more problem, with, with, with system requirements and requirement enhancements and all those in-depth details on the standards. And can 62443 and 27,000 work together? Well, yes, you can. I mean, we have in 62443, we have the 2-1 document, which is our... Uh, the, 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 the asset owner requirements, which is the cybersecurity management program, the CSMS, as we like to call it nowadays. Uh, 27001 has an ISMS. Well, I can tell you that we are waiting on the new version for 2-1 uh, on our side of the world, where we actually will be renaming our name CSMS into ISMS with mappings directly into 27001. Can you do the same things as you can do in 27001 as you can do in 6443? No, the topics are the same. The way we approach it is different because OT is different from IT. I mean, if two things are different, don't take the same approach. Yeah, and I guess just one follow-up there as well is when we deal with all the different vendors, the OEMs, the Schneiders, the ABB, and we're buying these systems like, you know, Again, like, you know, from a standards perspective, like, uh, you know, you know, when you think of IEC, they talk about, uh, you know, uh, security levels and, you know, things like that. So, again, I think, like, that's, that's something, you know, again, we saw the, the Resilience Act that came out this week with IoT devices, but it's good to know when you're buying a system what level it's at against the standard. Uh, and I think that's something it's, it's, that would work closer with Those the are two of our documents, the 4-1 and the 4-2, yeah. talking about components yeah. and making sure that the components, if you define the security level after you've done the assessment, if you define the security level and you know how you want to secure your system as an asset owner, yeah. that you can actually go to vendors and yeah. ask them like how well do you compare yeah. to that on a component level. Yes. Yeah, and just I suppose Brian, I might just ask you a little bit about the OEM providers and uh, yeah. just uh, what are the what are the key kind of things that you look from from the OBMs and the actions? Because I guess a lot yeah. of the security of the, the the HMIs, the PLCs, the RTUs. Like you are dependent a lot on the OEM, so oh, yeah. around that, you know, and they're, they're the real experts, and you know, it is very different and nuanced. So you might just talk a little bit around how you. Yeah, sure. I mean, um, you know, what Willie talks about is key. It gives you the baseline to, you know, understand where things should be, if you like. So it gives you some quite pointed areas to look at from an OEM perspective. Are they comp compliant? Probably isn't necessarily the correct word, but are they, you know, able to show you evidence of, you know, understanding that? And I guess compliance is the word I will use, um, but. The, the key thing, I suppose, as well, is understanding that some OEMs in this space are very far behind. There are some that are excellent, and some are kind of almost like in denial a little bit. Um, and the reason for that is probably the business model. So if you think about this space 
companies have probably spent, invested a huge amount of money in an environment that hasn't changed in 20 years, and they don't anticipate it changing greatly in 20 years. They're not going to rip the whole environment out. They're not going to go from, you know, Dell to HP or, you know, different vendors in terms of the IT space, which, you know, probably a three to five year cycle. You can do it, but you're not going to do it in this space. So the challenge with a lot of them is, um, and again, as I said, there's a lot, there's a broad church there, so it's not everybody, is the leverage. The key word I would say when looking at OEMs is obviously their compliance, their ability to respond to cyber challenges, what they can tell you, what they can show you, um, how they react to this conversation. Um, but really what you'll have to get into at some stage is your relationship with the OEM and the leverage that you have. What I mean by that is um, because those you know, investment cycles are quite long, if you've got an OEM that doesn't really get this problem or doesn't feel commercially compelled to solve it, which is sometimes the problem, you then need to look for leverage from the perspective of are, do we have a big um, you know, purchase coming up? Is there some other element we can leverage the vendor with? Because that, from my perspective or our perspectives, has been the most challenging thing is getting the vendors to move along with you. Yeah. So you can come up with a very evidence-based approach on, based on 62443, which is fantastic in terms of being able to explain to all those different stakeholders what your map is, what you're doing, how relevant it is to the rest of the world and how you know, um, industry standard it is. But if you're not seeing it from them, then you have to start pushing over other levers and it can be very challenging. Yeah, and I guess we were talking about the business case earlier <coughs> as well and I think that's the key part as well is you need people on your side yeah. holding these guys accountable that they're doing what you've been, you know, there's, you know, so there's a lot of trust which is the verification and again with the NIST directive getting the evidence back that uh, certain things are happening again. Yeah. I guess the Bible for OT cybersecurity is the, I'll, there might be different, the Purdue security model, which is very based on, I know <laughs> Willie will, but, uh, but, the, the, but I suppose a little bit is, it's very network focused, five minutes, Chris. Five, five minutes are left. That was, a, that was a minute ago. So but uh, the, network, <laughs> the, network, the network based approach, which has served us well, you know, and just, I just, again, I'm just interested with the OEMs just around securing the asset rather than the network and, you know, and, you know, with digital transformation coming and connectivity and getting yeah. data out of OT systems, you know, remote access, COVID, you know, there's, so just on that as well, just for the, maybe for the panel in general, just, just that Purdue model that we used to follow, like what did I see the, the key changes or the key challenges to that or evolvement of that in general? Well, briefly, I think, you know, defining digitalization, defining even this OTIT convergence, I mean, what do they mean? It's hard to know. I mean, fundamentally, I think to all of us, it means that you've got connectivity outside of that black box of a, of a distribution center or a factory or whatever it is, which is causing you or creating a lot of the threats that you potentially have. Um, so, you know, I think the fundamentals of what's there in 62443 and Purdue and whatever you want to look at, like if you don't do anything else, like understanding your assets and being able to segment them off, is you know hugely important and will bring you a long way down the road. So I think, you know, you could discuss the, the detail of it and how far it can go uh, all day. But I mean, to me, that's the piece you need to focus on, yeah. and it does allow you 6443 in particular allows you the ability to cut your cloth to pick a security level that's appropriate for your business. But I think people sometimes don't realise they think they have to go all the way, which is yeah. quite daunting. Yeah, yeah. So you can just take a piece and go from yeah, there. Yeah, so. maturity set. And just anyone else in the panel want to make a comment on that? I'd just say that it uh, doesn't matter what standard you follow. Uh, standard is, a, is just a set of criteria, a roadmap for securing your, your, your environment. Um, but what we, is really important is managing the risk and understanding your risk. What risk you are, as a business, are willing to, um, to, to live with within your OT environment um, and then design your cloth around that. And if that means pulling from this standard or pulling from that standard or developing your own criteria for, for cybersecurity, that's fine. You don't need to say, oh, I'm ISO 27001 certified or I'm following the Pro2 model. You, what you have to do is cut your cloth for your own environment and manage your risk. It's all about risk, a risk-based approach, managing the risk and putting proper governance, risk and compliance um, structure in place to do that. It's not just, oh, we have a risk, that's fine now, grand. You need a proper governance and compliance structure around to manage that risk. And the appropriate people uh, need to be making the decisions on that risk. It's, it's not leave it to the junior IT guy or the junior IT, OT guy to decide what the risks you're going to take on your plant downtime is. Yeah, who's uh, accountable, who's responsible. Exactly, who exactly, exactly. Yes, I agree. 
So I know we're close to time, so uh, can last... I, last can I, can I yeah, add, of course, William. Yeah, if I can add to, to this final topic. Um, I, the, you, you call it the Purdue model, the official standard is called ISA 95, or if you want to stay into the IEC says, uh, versions 62264. Um, Purdue is easier to say. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> we gave training courses. I mean, I'll invite you for a training course. Um, no, but the, 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 the thing that does, where it can help you when you want to do, go into the digitization or how you want to call it, you want to call it NC 4.0, digitization, IoT, IoT, I don't care. Um, these standards are there to help you define data flows between different systems, between different functions. And as my mother used to tell me, Willie, if you do not make a mess, you do not need to clean up. She was talking about my bedroom, but the, we, I think it applies to data communication yeah. as well. No, thanks, Willie. And we just might have one last question before we go. If there's one thing the audience were going to take away today around OT systems, what would you say the number one kind of, where's, where's the starting point? Is it, is it understanding what you have in asset discovery, or is it, what, what would you say the key thing is? Yeah, well, I mean, get, get, sit down and plan something that's going to take a few years. If, you ha if you're not doing anything, and you probably are doing something you don't know about, but sit down and plan something and prepare for it to take a few years, because yeah. it will. It's not very glamorous. You have to patch stuff. You have to find stuff. But asset management, find out where your assets are, yeah. what they're doing. That's yeah. the most important thing. Anyone change from that? Or is I'd just uh, say that um, <coughs> cybersecurity is across the board. It's not just IT. OT, just saying it's, um, it's a standalone network is not, uh, it's, it's not uh, good enough anymore. Um, and uh, security by obscurity never worked. Um, so don't rely on it. Uh, you need cybersecurity controls across the board. If you if it's if there's a a particular um, a particular person that I, I particularly like to he's a uh, cybersecurity specialist from F Secure and he came out a few years ago with a saying that if it's smart it's vulnerable, um, and that equally applies to OT to IT to um, anything. If if it's got a chip in it. And if it can be connected to, it's vulnerable. Yeah, isolation is not security. That's what I'm hearing loud and clear. Uh, Willie? I think that, uh, I would say to people is that um, cybersecurity is more than just a shiny object. Um, not only the firewalls, it is a cultural change that we need to get into the OT environment. Yeah. We didn't talk about that in this session a lot, but it is every, it's, it's like we did 15 years ago with safety. We need to have a cultural change in the OT environment, making sure that people understand that cybersecurity is important and they need to be on the team as well. Yeah. Okay, thanks, guys. Yeah. That's it, yeah. Thank you. Thank you.